USA Emergency Broadcast Network, your source for reliable disaster preparedness information. The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily the views of this station, its management, sponsors, or other hosts. If you have any comments or suggestions about this program, please contact us at radio at usaebn.org. That's radio at usaebn.org. Welcome to the Zeta Report here on USA Emergency Broadcasting Network. We are live first Mondays of every month. I'm Andre. I'm with USA EBN, and I'm joined by my co-host for the Zeta Report, Nancy from ZetaTalk.com. Nancy, how are you? Hey, hi. I'm so happy to be here. Today we're going to talk about why won't the media ever say Nibiru? You never see it in print. You never see it on the talking heads. Uh, No matter how many signs there are that Nibiru exists and is in our solar system, the nightly news will not report this, nor will the establishment admit this. Like Voldemort in the Harry Potter series, one does not mention its name. Apparently, to do so would be to cause Nibiru to manifest, like Voldemort did. Nibiru is he who does not get named nor mentioned. But before we get into this, I want to read our standard disclaimer in partnership with USA ABN. Zeta Talk and the Zeta Report will be discussing the challenges of living on a planet beset with change, rising seas, increasing earthquakes, and volcanic activity, weather gone wild, and the worry of what to do in a worst-case scenario. We will also inject Zeta Talk prophecy on what is coming next and advice on readiness plans and safe locations. Whenever Zeta Talk is quoted, please remember that prophecy is not fact. It is opinion. It only becomes fact when it happens. The Zetas are remarkably accurate but have been wrong on occasion. Bear that in mind. For more information on this subject, please visit Zetatalk.com or the Zeta Report on YouTube. Now, before we get into the specifics of how Nibiru is showing up on mankind's scientific uh, releases like in from stuff coming from the sun and, and uh, electromagnetic, uh, you know, Schumann resonance, on and on. I want to explain a little bit what Z- Nibiru is, where that term came from, that name came from, and how the ancient Sumerians, etc., were aware The ancient Sumerians documented the appearance and lifestyle of the Anunnaki. Via the Anunnaki, the ancient Sumerians were aware of our outer planets all the way to and including Pluto long before mankind discovered Pluto. They counted the planets from the outside in toward the sun as this would be what they would encounter on the trip back to Earth. Now, how did the Anunnaki know about all these planets? Because... They live on Nibiru, uh, and and uh, they visited Earth to collect gold. So the only way they knew was because they're real. They did exist, these very heavy-set, eight-foot-tall guys, muscular. Zachariah Sitchin translated ancient Sumerian texts showing that these ancients were aware that the Anunnaki's home planet, Nibiru, comes into the solar system periodically every 3,600 years. Ships would then shuttle between Nibiru and Earth. Landing strips to guide the shuttles were carved into the rock and can be seen today in Peru and elsewhere around the world. The ancient Sumerians depicted Nibiru as a winged globe, a planet that flies. Nibiru is the official name assigned to the planet of the crossing by the ancient Sumerians, though it is also known by many other names, such as Planet X by NASA and JPL, Wormwood or the Lord in the Bible, and the Destroyer by the Oashbi has a lot of different names. The Anunnaki even made an appearance on the Swiss Frank. There they are, tall and with narrow heads, striding through the solar system. The Swiss Frank even shows the elongated orbit of Nibiru. So even the Illuminati want to brag that they were aligned with the Anunnaki. To avoid panic in the public, the cover-up over the approach of Nibiru was mandated by Reagan 
by President Reagan in an executive order after its approach was confirmed in 1983 by the IRAS. Up until that discovery, the search for a planet out toward Orion was openly admitted in the press. The gravity and pull was often called nemesis in the press. Quoting Astronomy Magazine in 1981, and I quote, Beyond Pluto in the cold, dark regions of space may lie an undiscovered tenth planet two to five times the size of Earth. Astronomers at the U.S. Naval Observatory were using a powerful computer to identify the best target zones, and a telescope search will soon follow afterwards. Van Flandern thinks the tenth planet may have been two to five times Earth's mass and uh, lie 50 to 100 astronomical units from the sun. Now, uh, I, I also want to mention that there was recently, oh, two, three years ago, a fluff in the press about, oh, Planet Nine, we've discovered some body out toward Orion, you know, some gravity tug. And, and, uh, well, they were really talking about Nemesis. That's the sun's... Um, binary twin, and it's a big gravity tug out there. So this talk, but in before 1981, it was called Nemesis, and I, that's my preferred tag for it, too, because it is not Nibiru. Coincidentally, Pioneer 10 sent out in the direction of Orion to see what it could see died in 2003. Uh, diagrams appearing in the 1987 edition of the New Science and Invention Encyclopedia shows Nemesis, a popular name for our sun's binary companion, as a dead star. The diagram also shows the approximate location of a tenth planet. We're talking about Nibiru. Nibiru would be our tenth planet. Nibiru is described as a dragon in the book of Revelations, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. That's the quote from Revelations. The ancient Babylonians likewise described Nibiru as a dragon, picturing him as the alchemical dragon Azoth with his twin sons and a moon. The drawing is very revealing as we uh, do indeed have two sons at present. Saul and Nibiru, and in the drawing, the moon is turning its face away. The moon does have a more eccentric orbit due to Nibiru's presence, and thus the face is indeed turned these past few years. Mother Ship Shipton likewise refers to Nibiru as a dragon. I quote, the mountains will begin to roar. The earthquakes split the plains to shore. Not every soul on earth will die as the dragon's tail goes sweeping by. End of the quote. In India, the god Shiva, the god of destruction and renewal, represents Nibiru. Shiva also has a red aspect about him. Sure sounds like Nibiru. Quoting Wikipedia, the cosmic function of creation, maintenance, and destruction are personified by the forms of Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the uh, maintainer or preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer or transformer. These three deities have been called the Hindu triad, end of the quote. Kali, one of Shiva's wives, has a dusky blue color. This seems to be the Earth's dark twin, Quoting Wikipedia, the name Kali means black, time, death, lord of death. Kali is represented as the consort of Lord Shiva, on whose body she is often seen standing. Kali is portrayed mostly in two forms, the popular four-armed form and the ten-armed ah, makashika form. In both of her forms, she is described as being black in color, but is most often depicted as blue in popular Indian art. Why the, why the blue tone? Because the dark twin of Earth, which normally rides in Earth's orbit exactly opposite the, and behind the sun, so we never see it, but we hear about it from the ancients who got there on spaceships or whatever. So 
Why is it black? Because it has no water, has no life, big black hunk of rock about the same weight as Earth. But when Earth got stalled in her orbit by planet a- or Nibiru standing in her way, the dark twin came up from behind, and when uh, it was first seen by people, it flashed blue and yellow because those are the colors that it would reflect. So therefore, bluish in color. The Hopi Indians also depict Nibiru and the Earth's dark twin as the red kachina and blue kachina. These are certainly the colors of these planets when they become visible. For the Zetas, the Earth's dark twin comes up behind the Earth in their shared orbit. It's pushed close to the Earth but escapes from this crunch during the last weeks. That's why Kali stands over Shiva at the end during the passage. They both move on, and it's viewed as, well, Kali, you know, chased away Shiva. Nuwa, the legend of Nuwa in China is highly allegorical, but clear in its description of the crustal shift that occurred. The Nuwa legend describes the globe tilting during the past pole shifts, so the sun and north pole appear in new locations. The sky moved to the northwest, and the globe slid to the southeast. That's according to that legend. Per the ancient Sumerians, Nibiru had a 3,600-year orbit. If Nibiru is with us now, then the last passage was approximately 1,600 B.C., when the Greek volcano island of Thera, now known as Santorini, blew. Carbon dating puts this at 1,628 B.C., Thera's explosion was immense, four four to five times Krakatoa in 1883, and equal to several hundred atomic bombs. This is also the time when Moses led his people out of Egypt. The Exodus is reported in the Torah and Book of Exodus, and Egyptian Colbrin, and the Egyptian Ipur Papyrus. There can be no carbon dating to fix this date. Historians estimate 1,200 B.C., but there are gaps in calendars for hundreds of years. The Egyptian census stopped, record-keeping stopped. It was a confused time. Slaves just walked away. Another time-dated clue is the disappearance of the mammoths from the Arctic. These were herbivores and required lush grasslands to live, yet their bones are found in Wrangell Island in the Arctic. Frozen mammoths died out an estimated 3,700 years ago on Wrangell Island, and to have arrived there approximately 7,400 years ago. Both are increments of the 3,600 period of Nibiru's passage. Quoting GeoCities, Wrangell Island is 120 miles off the coast of Siberia. Fossil remains of six-foot-tall, two-ton woolly mammoths found there have been carbon dated to only 3,700 years ago. The carbon dating of the fossil remains indicates the mammoths lived on Wrangell Island from 7,390 before the present. End of the quote. In the opinion of the Zetas, Nibiru returned in 2003, entering the inner solar system in 2003 from the direction of Orion. This was the direction the infrared team was gazing at in 1983 and where they found it inbound in 1983. Other than the astonishing accuracy of Zeta Talk coordinates, which described exactly where and when a traveling, smoldering brown dwarf star might be found. There is no proof of this arrival. Boy, did we take the f- images. We took Fitzfiles images, which cannot be doctored because they are too dense. And these are available, by the way, on my website for anyone who wants to check it out. We followed it inbound from 2001 to 2003, took all kinds of photos, infrared photos, went to observatories on several different continents, and and we we tracked it in, and the Zetas were, like, astonishingly accurate. Okay. International teams, amateur astronomers who were Zeta Talk fans, were tracking this inbound smoldering star and utilized infrared imaging where possible. 
this brown dwarf would appear on star charts where none should be, and then a couple weeks later it would disappear, having moved on to be at the next coordinates that had been given by the Zetas. It was it was right on target. On February 7, 2001, an observatory in France imaged the Nibiru complex. The excited email stated, and I quote, The New Shadow Observatory got it. They were very excited, wondering if it is a comet or a brown dwarf through the latest coordinates that you gave. I'm going to ask for further details. The daughter of the astronomer reports they were su they suspected a comet or a brown dwarf in the process of becoming a pulsar since it emits waves, end of the quote. The astronomer, who was an astronomer, was not given permission to release the image. So there we are. Then a try in the U.S., and I quote, on the night of Sunday, April 1st, 2001, I reserved the historic Clark 24-inch telescope at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, for my own private viewing. As it turns out, the telescope operator was unable to point the Clark in the direction of Orion because there was scaffolding in the way which only the operator's supervisor was allowed to move, end of the quote. Oops, they knew we were coming, and they blocked it. Amateur astronomers began to capture images of the inbound Nibiru, most easily captured when it was still out in the night sky. A double helix emerged, but when Nibiru slung close to the sun within the orbit of the Earth, it was lost in the glare of the sun. The public began to get second sun sightings as this in the spring of 2003, where light in the red spectrum curves over the horizon at dawn or dusk, so the light source from both the sun and Nibiru can be seen. This phenomenon was completely ignored by the media and official sky watchers. Who are you going to believe, they ask, our official version or your lion eyes? Observatories were unnoticed not to give evidence of Nibiru, but on May 26, 2003, a second sun sighting was captured in California on the Mount Wilson Observatory in San Gabriel Canyon above L.A. Within a day, the webcam had been pointed in a different direction, unable to view the rising sun, but the observatory folks had a sense of humor. They hung a basketball in front of the cam and labeled it, Planet X. It's funny. Meanwhile, an amateur astronomer in Italy emerged as a hero. <coughs> he had been taking photos of the Nibiru complex since 2003 using filters for red as recommended by the Thetas. Alberto discovered that the ins insert of floppy disk would filter to allow the red light spectrum to dominate. That was the recommendation of the Thetas. Myler also had this effect. Welder's lens tended to block out too much light. The Internet to this day is busy with amateurs taking these snaps. Another feature occasionally seen naked eye is the string of pearls phenomenon. This has been recorded on film since 2004 and shows up on NASA's SOHO images too. In the opinion of the Thetas, the phenomenon is caused by a string of moons trailing along behind Nibiru, captured by Nibiru's immense gravity field. The recent string of pearls sighting was dramatically captured last November 2017 by some hunters along the Missouri River. They saw the string of pearls overhead, but then the clouds parted and each of the 12 moons in the string reflected sunlight down onto the river. Caught on film and examined by experts, this is no fraud. What, actu what actual proof of Nibiru's existence beyond signs in the skies? There is the twisting of the Earth's magnetosphere, ongoing since Nibiru arrived in 2003. We could point to airliners flying into mountains and electric trains flying off their rails and blackouts and explosions, but these issues are always debated. The pilot was suicidal or the equipment was old, that sort of thing. Let's look at the magnetosphere history since 2009. Batsrus, B-A-T-S-R-U-S, 
modeling is collected from satellite data and displayed as though looking at the Earth's magnetosphere from the side. This shows the expected blast from the sun, the solar wind, with the Earth's magnetosphere blown back behind the Earth into wings. Up until 2012, the magnet imaging was garnered from a site in Japan which relied on the Earth's magnetic fields for the model input. The contortions caused by Nibiru were becoming too obvious. Then the public was forced to use the Batsra system, which gained its input from many sources. Thus, inputs could be selectively eliminated from a display. Thus, the contortions could be blamed on the sun. But even the under Batsrus, the contortions caused by Nibiru showed up. A dipole lean in 2012, explained only by the presence of Nibiru, uh, which confused the Earth. The Zetas explained the dipole lean, and I quote, Magnets want to go side by side, as the planets do with the sun, or end to end. If not allowed to go end to end, they, uh, they choose a side by side arrangement. The lesser magnet can go into opposition or attempt to form a T arrangement. Uh, so in other words, they were describing how magnets might line up with each other. As a child knows, you know, putting little magnets on a glass and running a big one underneath, they like to line up end to end. If they can't do that, they might try to make a T arrangement, uh, but uh, they will go into opposition uh, if forced into it. That means aligning with one of the magnetic field lines going around and around the magnet. So it's not just simplistic. However, it did seem to model the Earth's magnetic field, but the blasts and contortions due to the approach of Nibiru were getting stronger. Jump to 2017 when the Earth's magnetosphere, as modeled by Batsrus, was so confused and scrambled that it was hardly discernible. It was like watching a horror show. Electromagnetic pulse is on the increase, and this is measurable. Since Nibiru entered the solar system in 2003, we have seen an exponential increase in magnetosphere compression. These contortions were blamed on the sun even when it was solar minimum, even when the sunspots were completely absent. After a while, the establishment just fell silent. But what cannot be denied is that President Trump issued an executive order that the U.S. infrastructure should be checked and hardened to resist EMP. Why would he do that if EMP were not on the increase? Quoting the White House executive order, and I quote, The federal government must foster sustainable, efficient, and cost-effective approaches to improving the nation's resilience to the effects of EMP, end of the quote. Recently, NASA has emerged to report that the South Atlantic anomaly, referred to as a second South Pole, has been seen to drift toward the west side of Africa. The anomaly normally res resides between the tip of South America and the tip of Africa. Why should it drift? Quoting DTV News, and I quote, the visualization released on Monday of the changing magnetic fields between 215 and 2025 shows the anomaly splitting off into two distinct regions in the next few years. End of the quote. Quoting Science Alert. New readings provided by the ESA's swarm satellites show that within the past five years, a second center of of minimum intensity has begun to open up within the anomaly. This suggests the whole thing could even be in the process of splitting up into two separate cells with the original centered above the middle of South America and the new emerging cell appearing to the east, hovering off the coast of South Africa. End of the quote. Oh, well, the Zetas had something to say about that. Uh, no one had an answer about the anomaly, but the Zetas did. They tied it to the daily Earth wobble in the opinion of the Zetas, and I quote, Our prediction for the locations of the new poles after the pole shift for the magnetic south pole is to be located over India. First, there is pressure on the magnetic north pole to locate over the bulge of Brazil. 
the crustal shift is pushing Brazil toward that location, and as a predecessor of the daily polar push is shoving that part of the globe up toward the magnetic north pole of Siberia. Meanwhile, the pressure on the magnetic south pole follows. The south pole is a magneton intake and thus tries to position to be opposite the magnetic north pole. Thus, if the eventual new north pole off the bulge of Brazil is being tugged toward the magnetic north pole of Earth in Siberia, the South Atlantic anomaly is being tugged toward India. End of the quote. Well, that's not crystal clear, but basically, if you take Siberia and the anomaly and where they are now, and you keep moving it, you know, you'll find that the North Pole, Brazil, and the South Pole, India, are opposite each other. The, the future poles are being already lined up as anomalies or drifting North Pole, however you want to put it. Okay, Mr. MBB333 runs a very popular video site that compiles unusual observations from around the world, but he cannot say the word Nibiru. He shows signs in the skies such as second sun captures, intense UV damage even when the sun is asleep, and documentation on when the sun is rising or setting in the wrong place but he never ascribes this to a second source or cause. Don't say Valdemar. Some quotes from Mr. MBB's comments. And that's where you find out whether people buy it or don't buy it. And I quote, Here in the UK by the North Sea, daybreak there here has been between 3 and 4 a.m. far too early. Every morning has been a bright orange to dark pink sunrise, some nights it is hardly getting dark for for more than a couple of hours. In other words, way too much light in the UK. Another, my mom, who is 97 and has lived in the same house for over 60 years, told me only yesterday that the sun she can see out her back garden is on the wrong side of the tree. I live in... I live... I live in Cambodia for eight years. I have sunrise and sunset view and see them every day. I guarantee the sun is not the same as before. And another. I've noticed the sun coming from the north for about five years. I live in Delaware, so I can't understand why people are now just noticing this. And also notice how white the sun has been for around about that time. End of the quote. People talk about scalding. Uh, and and uh, and show sweet peppers burned as though somebody put a laser on them, and they say they go out in the sun and they get a sunburn and a suntan like that fast. In the mag, if the magnetosphere charts are seen by few, the daily Earth wobble is experienced by many. In fact, anyone who notices where the sun is rising or setting these days, the atypical weather. The establishment only reports local news, so the public does not get the big picture, but the figure eight wobble pattern is discernible in weather charts, which show the temperature lining up with the degree of sunlight provided by the wobble. And this was true of the reports from China 3,600 years ago. During the last pole shift, i.e. 1,600 B.C., the reign of Emperor G of Zia suffered, and this was well recorded. I quote, In the 29th year of King Shen, the sun was dimmed. King Shen lacked virtue. The sun was distressed. During the last years of Shen, ice formed in mornings and frosts into six months. Heavy rainfall fall toppled temples and buildings. Heaven gave severe orders. The sun and moon were untimely. Hot and cold weather arrived in disorder. The five cereal crops withered and died. End of the quote. Now, aren't we having something similar to that now, where we're having increasing crop shortages, deluge rains, etc.? So, sun in, uh, snow in the summer, that's happening increasingly. But come on, man, as Biden would say. So the weather is a little erratic and the sun seems to rise in the wrong place. That's just an opinion, right? Not according to the Earth Orientation Center charts, which show the location of the Earth magnetic north pole as oriented to the stars, the terrestrial system. 
This is normally depicted as a circle. The circle began swinging in a larger and larger circle in 2013. To quote from the Earth Orientation Center, hosted by a French observatory that charts where the magnetic north pole of Earth is pointing. And I quote, The Earth's orientation is defined as the rotation from the Earth's cross, the terrestrial system, to a geocentric set of axes tied to the quasars, the geocentric celestial system, to be distinguished from the referenced celestial system, having for origin the very center of the solar system, end of the quote. Clear as mud, but if you look at the chart, you can see that. There, it's just circles, and, there, and it begins to spiral outward, and they have dates, you know, along the spiral. Now, what's causing that? Huh? Because people's imagination? Oh, no, no, just a, just a lens flare in the camera. No, no, just... Listen to NASA. Go back to shopping. The, the disrupted Schumann resonance is another clear indication that something is slamming the Earth these days. It's not just the red dust and the increasing bolides inbound. This is official and measurable, not your imagination. What is the Schumann resonance? Quoting Trifinity.com. The ancient Indian Risha called 7.83 hertz the frequency of Aum. It also happens to be Mother Earth's natural heartbeat rhythm, known as the Schumann Resonance. In June 2014, that apparently changed. Monitors at the Russian Space Observing System showed a sudden spike in activity to around 8.5 hertz. Since then, they have recorded days with the Schumann accelerated as fast as 16.5 hertz end of the quote, and then uh, it's taken offline. If it gets too erratic, it's just one big black mark, you know, for hours or days even, and then it comes back on because they don't want you to know how bad it's getting. Okay, except you don't go around saying, um, or maybe you do to try to get 7.83 you know, on a personal level. All right, but perhaps all this will go back to normal if we just remember that like Valdemont, he who shall not be named is among us. Uh, but just don't say his name. Don't say Nibiru. Something terrible will happen if you do. And that's the end of my prepared remarks. Andre, how are you doing? Um, I'm, I'm here. I, there's some things that you just can't say or there <laughs> have pressure or, you know, there could be other influences on, like, say, BBB. Maybe he's trying to hint at it and doesn't want to say it because he doesn't want to lose his channel or something like that. I'm not sure. Or his you know, life. Censorship or his and life. everything else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that know, does happen. Um, and the people are being, look how Q and Q and Lon are being attacked lately. Like, oh, and they're so right. accurate. They are so accurate. The one that really stuck me, struck me was, you know, uh, John McCain's execution and, and where uh, to, to the day, month, second almost, Hugh said, blah, 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 what the date would be. Every do uh, dog will have its day, dead dog. And it was a month later on Dead Dog Day, or Dog Day, or I guess it was, and the obituaries, which you could look up, were exactly 30 days after Q said, made his statement, to the hour, the minute. I'm not sure about the second, but I was so stunned. In other words, he was assigned to be executed or, or on that moment, at that moment. And that's what they put in the obituary. So that that did it for me. If, if anyone challenges Q, and then... It, it, it's just like undeniable, and then the accuracy. So, um, yeah, it's but a, of course he's just, what, a, he's what, just uh, you know, just a, a LARP or whatever they call a troll. You know, not no accuracy. Some guy, some teenager in his basement snickering away. That's all it is. And, right. You know, they they can't stand it because nerds, it's some true. nerds on eight chan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that type of well, thing. Well, it was fascinating about that, not to get too far down the rabbit hole of Q, but um, what's fascinating for me is being, you know, following it since, like, the second day. I was like, wow, what's going on here? 
but if you go back to one year and two year deltas, like previous posts from one year ago or or two years ago, it yeah. lines up almost perfectly too. And I'm like, oh, not every post. I mean, not everything does, but there's a lot of hints a year yeah. ago or two years ago of how exactly things are going to be happening in this now. And that's, like, exactly. that's a good technology, a really, 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 really detailed plan. Yes. And it's uh, all a Nancy, plan. Uh, it, just a, yeah? Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, you go ahead. You, you. It's all, uh, all right. Um, I just wanted to segue into, can you, can you tell the listeners or viewers out there, it, are there sites other than Zeta Talk that put up a straight, uh, straight report of what's going on in the skies? You know, not saying Nibiru, maybe saying Planet X, maybe saying Planet Nine. Is there any, any yeah. legitimate yeah, I'm, sources I'm, out there other than Zeta yeah. Talk? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, they're related to Zeta Talk. There's a Facebook account called Zeta Talk Followers, uh, and, uh, and it's run by uh, Juan Martinez and a few other people that I know and uh, that are solid Zeta Talk fans. I know solid Juan. In, uh, Juan Juan Martinez, yes. And and then there's Alberto uh, in Italy, who's 85 years old, has a second person in Idaho who's taking a lot of photos. Actually, there's more than one. There's Julie and Manuel. And they're getting very good photos of Nibiru and the Nibiru complex, you know, like Alberto has always gotten. Uh, and as he's fading, because 85 and he had to struggle with the coronavirus in Italy, too, uh, said I uh, had problemo yeah. with con virus, you know. So, um, so Juan, you know, picks up a lot of those photos from those folks in Idaho and posts them on to Bullshit Ning and Zeta Talk followers. And Zeta Talk followers gets a lot of uh, information too, and it's well maintained by people that I know and trust. So, in other words, if someone tries to come in and post garbage, they get, you know, get, no, no, you can't right. post here. Another is a Twitter account which is called Zeta Talk, I think pound sign Zeta Talk, and it's run by uh, the gentleman who started the Columbia um, Mirror site, and he has dual citizenship with uh, with Canada, uh, and he's just as solid as a rock, too. And he, and he forwards very specific information on Twitter. So um, th this is... Uh, uh, I'm glad to see we have more than just the pole shift ning uh, because of the attacks that keep coming. And you never know. And the pole shift ning is located physically in California, uh, close enough to the San Andreas in L.A. that uh, I worry about backups and what would happen if there was a tremendous amount of earthquakes there. Would we be offline for a while? Well, there's other sites, you know, will will pick up the banner. We do have 16 mirror sites for Zeta Talk itself. Uh, all over the world, you know. So that's a lot of stability. And they were designed in the locations to allow every continent to have access, even if the uh, under underwater cables get ripped, you know, internet yeah. cables uh, and the like, so that uh, hopefully people will find Zeta Talk if, if it gets taken down in their vicinity. Is Zeta Talk X, you just had a number for the X, Zeta Talk 5.com, Zeta Talk 6.com, all the way up to 15, and uh, there you are, you'll get Zeta Talk. So that's, okay, all, cool. that's all I have, yeah, yeah. But other than yeah, that, uh, I don't know I you, of anybody I would trust to say follow this person or that person because there was so much disinformation and deliberate, you know, where it's, they're put out uh, as I'm a leader, or you can follow me, you can trust me, and 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 it's uh, the garbage is mixed in with the truth. And then when when it's the key right. times, uh, they'll say something that's not true. So other than the Zeta Talk and these sites that I mentioned, I wouldn't advise anybody. Okay. Um, speaking of websites, I asked you in an email earlier this week uh, what month you officially launched the ZetaTalk.com website. Do you know it's been 25 uh, years, Nancy? I know. It's been 25 years, yeah. Uh, and 25 I remember, years? I remember Zeta that Talk? year. Yeah, I think it was an August month, but uh, I went into uh, Michael Lindemann's ISCNI, I think it's uh, Institute to Talk with a Conscious uh, 
non-terrestrial intelligence or something like that. And and it was in on AOL. It was a chat group, and I went in there. Uh, and I had just recently gotten the internet, uh, and uh, somebody said, you know, well, I don't think I'm a contactee, but some of you are. If we give you our questions, will you bring back the answers? And I said, oh, I'm getting my answers all the time. What is it? And and so people started asking questions, and I started relaying what the Zeta said. That was the start of Zeta Talk in January of, of uh, 1995. And then... Six months later, they wanted to uh, put up a website, and I was one of the invitees, right? And I was blah, right in there with all my stuff, you know, learning how to create hypertext and et cetera, et cetera. They never did even get anything put up. It just I, We just took it over, you know. And, and so Michael Lindemann walked off in a huff, kind of, I guess, you know, uh, and, and let me have it, and, and that was the end of, you know. So... Uh, it had been immensely uh, popular. People loved it or hated it. It took off like a shot. And I get I get Zeta Talk uh, email or I get email from all over the world. I guess you know uh, South South uh, you know Antarctica or up there in the Arctic or the deep Congo. Maybe not there. You know, but every other right. country. You know, I'm even getting from China, even though they tried to block Zeta Talk for you know a lot of blocking and people find a way to get around it if your gateway is blocked you you get one of these dial-up thingies and you bounce around it you know to be able to go and pull in your zeta talk i heard that from a german guy in saudi arabia the first day they had to start subsidizing their farmers because there were crop shortages you know they blocked zeta talk from their one gateway in Saudi Arabia because it was too accurate and it was pointing out that they yeah. had crop shortages you know but there was a German guy that was down there as an engineer or whatever he said when I couldn't get through to get my data talk I figured out how to do dial up and get around it and that's how I knew that they had done that so it's it's like we talk about being blocked but there's always the internet is difficult to block it was designed to be like water running around rocks you know you cannot stop it well, I just want to be, if it, it, it hasn't happened before, I just want to wish you a happy 25th anniversary of the oh. talk. This is, what is it, the oh. silver, silver anniversary? Yeah, or or crystalline? Yeah. I don't know. What, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the huge but amount that's of cool. vast reservoir. And I don't throw any of it away. It's all there. It's all historical. What I, what yeah, I, great I find is... I can go back and and with something I just recently said, I can go back and find out something 15 years ago I'm on the same subject and it correlates. They don't contradict themselves. I mean, this is this is one of the things that is personal proof to me uh, how accurate Zeta Talk is and it's the real thing. Of course, I have like 20 million, you know, confirmations all the time. I can tell you, but but that's one of them. I just love it. An example of that is that at one point they said that um, uh, Nibiru, that, that the Anunnaki uh, have, have uh, that the gravity pull uh, on Nibiru is like a one and a half times that of Earth, right? Or something along those lines. And, and I got a frantic email from somebody saying, wait a minute, you said it's 23 times the mass? It should be 23 times the pull of Earth. I said, <gasps> You know, but then he came back really quickly and said, oh, wait, wait, I did the calculations, the math. And it came out to 1.6 times the gravity pull of Earth. That's why the Anunnaki were eight foot tall, very muscular, big boned, you know, because they had to be more staunch to be able to resist the gravity pull of Nibiru. And if we went there, we would be flattened on the ground all the time, you know. So uh, yeah. that that's the kind of confirmation I get that, that on Zeta Talk all the time. Yeah, so if you're new to the subject of Nibiru, Pole Shift, Planet X, uh, you know, the other 12, 14 names that the other cultures have named it over the thousands of years, check out ZetaTalk.com. Uh, also, the sister site to that is PoleShift.ning.com. So PoleShift, one word, dot N-I-N-G dot com. There's a lot of blogs over there that cover Earth changes uh, up to date and up to the minute. And, you know, train derailments and gas gas lines and, and uh, you know, different anomalies, especially uh, 
a lot of great captures of the uh, Planet X Nimru complex in the sky. So um, the, that's updated daily as well. And Alberto's images are in there, as Nancy mentioned. But also on Facebook, Zeta Talk followers, check it out too. That's uh, solid. So thanks, Nancy. It's all the time we Thank have you. for Zeta, uh, Zeta Report. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Andre.